So the next session, um, we, have, um, we have three uh, speakers to continue on this theme that Karen introduced us to on the, uh, on the big theme, on the bigger picture. And to help us do that, uh, we have um, Leonce uh, Nindikumana. Uh, Leonce is from the University of Massachusetts, uh, has also been associated with, for a long time with the uh, African Development Bank, the UN Committee on Development Policy. Uh, we have uh, Mina Balamuni Lutz, who is Professor of Economics at uh, the University of North Florida. She's currently in Ghana with the Africa Central Center for um, Economic Transformation. And um, we have um, Kai Gehring, who's um, at the University of, of Heidelberg and is doing a lot of work on uh, gender issues. So you'll have uh, full details of everybody on this piece of paper here which is out with the agenda. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Leonce to uh, come and uh, say something about his research work for Recom on this important topic, and then we'll take um, the next speaker, and then the third, and then we'll take some questions and some discussion. So Leonce, please, if you could join us. Good morning, everybody, and I uh, would like to thank uh, UNU wider for giving me the opportunity to be here, to uh, take part in this uh, interesting discussion. Um, <clears throat> my contribution is, is about uh, a beginning, really, a beginning of uh, an analysis of how aid contributes to um, improving both human development and specifically gender. Um, and I'm saying it's a beginning because I, yesterday we were talking about dinner. I think we all agree that this is the first time that actually the research and policy community zeroes in on the linkages between aid and gender. And I'm happy to be able to take part of this, with this, this discussion. The, this paper is a joint work with uh, my colleague, uh, Linda Pickborn uh, from Hampshire College, who could not be here because she's doing more serious things. She's expecting, I'm, I'm soon going to be uh, an uncle, so I'm very excited. <laughs> um, but she sends her regards. So uh, Tony told me I have 15 minutes. I had prepared for an, uh, an hour and a half, so I don't know how I do that. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you a flavor of what, what we try to do in this paper and the following, uh, the follow-up uh, research. And then uh, during the discussion, you can ask me the more the, uh, the details about the work. So um, this work is a continuation of my own interest in the, in the issue of uh, aid effectiveness, um, which is something that donors have been focusing on and pushing for, basically asking what do, I, what do we get out of our, of our dollars? But at the same t at the, on the other side, for, on the recipient side, the people also in develop, developing countries have been asking, and I'm asking more loudly, about what they get out of all the aid with all the, th the, the things that it comes with. Uh, my second interest is, to, is with, with what, what uh, researchers have been calling the micro-macro paradox, which is that when we look at the impact of aid in development, there has been a lot of research on, at, the macro, at the macro level looking at how aid uh, improves uh, economic growth over time. Do countries that receive more aid grow faster? Can we establish a linkage between, between growth and, 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 development and aid? And the evidence is very mixed. Uh, in fact, you find that uh, some people will, will demonstrate that there is no impact with very good econometric analysis, and that does will prove that there is, a, there is impact. So you, we, we get very confusing uh, evidence. But at the micro level, you have more mileage in the sense that when you look at uh, sectoral level analysis, project level analysis, you can find impact of, of aid. But the problem is how do we, do we bridge the, 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 the micro level evidence and the macro level evidence? Um, in terms of illustrating the micro, the micro impact, I always give, always give an example of myself. Um, people contend that aid doesn't help, education doesn't help, 
uh, health, but I'm a product of public education, funded by public aid, and I think it works. Look at me. <laughs> but also, if you go to developing countries, you will see, you, you'll see uh, health clinics built by aid, good, good schools built by aid. I also give an example of uh, some very targeted projects that actually happened to work. In my work on, on Uganda, one of the, the uh, tools that really worked was uh, the school, school feeding uh, for, for kids. When kids were given lunch, they attended school more. So um, when, when aid is, is well targeted, it does, it does work. My other, in, my, the next interest is to look at aid and gender specifically, looking at how aid can help bridge the gaps. And we know that there are, there are huge gaps uh, in terms of human development. Inequality at, along gender is much wider. Uh, even if we look at what the, the, the traditional, the, the classic problems of, of uh, rural urban duality, the gaps are much larger when you look at the gender, the gender dimension. Education, yes, uh, developing countries have made a lot of, of progress in improving education in terms of enrollment, retention, completion rates, but the gaps are still significant. Uh, granted that there are countries, again, who have made a lot of progress in bridging that gap, and the question is, why, how do they do it? How can, uh, can other countries learn from that? Um, so we ask some very simple questions uh, that we try to add to uh, undertake with using um, data analysis, using uh, OECD dark data. And uh, I'm going to share quickly your, the results. Um, this has have already said. My, uh, go, going back to the, to the issue of uh, micro macro paradox. Um, here I'm drawing from a, a paper I did last year for the, the European Development Network which where I was trying to reflect about the ways in which we can explain why when we go on the field and look at specific projects, specific sectors, we do see some impact. But when we look at the macro, macro level, we don't find the impact. Uh, at the macro level, I'm, I'm saying, why is it that developing countries have been receiving so much aid and haven't grown faster? One is simply a quantity problem. Yes. Aid targeted does work, but we don't have enough of it. If you look at the needs, the amount of needs that, say, African countries have in infrastructure, aid, education, health, how much they would have to invest in those areas to generate meaningful impact, and compare that to the amount of resources that they, they have been, been generating, whether it is from aid, FDI, and, and government resources, the gap is huge. So the, the, one of the key, the, key, the key problems is the, the financing gap that still exists in, in uh, that countries still face. The other problem is the quality of, of aid, which is how it is, it is allocated across, across, across sectors, across, uh, across uh, users. And here I want to, to single out the fact that the donor community has not been very systematic, that has not been, been co consistent. You see shifts in terms of allocation of aid. Uh, there are, we go decades and people think that the, be, the best way to, to, to improve development is to invest in infrastructure. Then after a while, some people come up with evidence that no, no, it doesn't work. Then, then we shift to social, social development. And in fact, when you look at uh, the trend in, 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 in aid to say Af African, African countries, there, is, there has been a, a, a long period where aid to productive sectors have declined because we thought it was about reducing poverty, and the way you do that is to go to social sectors. But as, as Karen has, has, has said, you need to eventually create the results. If you want to, to reduce poverty, one of the things you have to do in, in uh, countries where 90, 80% of the population is in the rural sector, is in agriculture, is to get agriculture grow, going. And my own view is that for most of the developing countries to develop and to improve in well-being, you need agriculture to be more productive, which means you need to invest in, in infrastructure that helps agriculture raise productivity. So allocation of aid is, is, is key. The, the second problem is weak additionality, in the sense that Every, many times we have done aid in, a, in such a way that 
people go in as individual donors, as individual projects, and you, it, you don't have leverage of the, of, the, of the aid that's being allocated. Whereas, if you were going to pool the resources so that everybody goes in to try to attract other people from, from, uh, to, to contribute to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the projects, then you get spillover effects, technological and knowledge transfer, and so on. So that uh, <clears throat> we, we aid that would play what we call a catalytic role in mobilizing more, more additional resources. Development, uh, regional development institutions do this much better than, than, than individual donors. I was at the, at, the, at the African Development Bank. I can tell, talk to you about this uh, over, over coffee if you like. Um, the third problem is that aid has remained very timid in terms of influencing institutions. And the, tensions he, the tension here is about whether donors should be involved in improving institutions at the country level. Some people will tell you that donors should stay away from institutions, but I'm, I'm going to tell you that you cannot improve effectiveness if you don't improve institutions. And one of the, one of the, one of the weaknesses of the aid uh, processes that we have been, we have been uh, using is they are very, very, very much removed from influencing and improving uh, uh, institutions. The fourth problem is poor alignment of incentives and interest between the donor and the country. Uh, many times the, the donors come with, with their own interest and it doesn't match with what the countries are trying to do. And, many, and unfortunately countries have a, a start at, at a lower bargaining, bargaining position. And what's being uh, targeted is not necessarily the, the priority in the country. Uh, the last point is we, lack of learning. Uh, we have been in the aid business for so long, and many times you'll be surprised. We keep making the same mistakes. We refuse to learn. And that's what, uh, one of the reasons why we haven't been as effective as, as we could. Um, yes. So I have said that we have made substantial uh, progress, but we still have huge... Um, Way, long, long way to go. Um, so in this particular uh, project, what we're trying to do is address three, three very simple questions. One is, does increasing the volume of aid help ameliorate human development outcomes at the country level? Okay. The second one is, does sectoral allocation of aid um, in, improve human, human uh, development? Here what we, call, what we mean by sectoral allocation, we, we mean aid going to health, aid going to education, aid going to infrastructure, water and sanitation. Do you get better results if you, if you put more money in that? Um, then specifically we want to look at how sectoral allocation of aid affect gender, gender, uh, gender gaps because some sector aid have clear implications on, on, on gender. Like aid to education, we want to ask whether it, it increases it reduces the gender gap in terms of youth literacy between women and, 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 and men. But also in the case of, of, uh, of aid to, to health, we want to see whether it helps reduce maternal, maternal mortality. Um, we find that uh, if, again, I can tell you about the, the mechanics, uh, the, the, te the technique about how we, we do the analysis. But in terms of the, the key results is that overall, there, is, there, is, there appears to be some positive impact of aid uh, 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 sector allocation on, um, on, on human development in general. Um, but there's always a but. This is conditional to initial conditions. In the sense that when you look at countries that start at a lower level of human development, they tend to improve faster. It's not surprising. Um, if, you, if, if I look at Africa specifically, you do see that improvements in, in, in human development, for example, are much higher in sub-Saharan Africa than in, in North Africa because North Africa starts at a higher level. But uh, when you look at impact of, gen, of, of aid allocation, you find that controlling for in, in initial conditions, you, have, you, do, you lose the positive impact of, of, of aid. It, does, it, it makes sense in the sense that uh, to the extent that aid is try, it typically targets the lower levels or the lower income countries, which have other structural problems other than lack of resources, they tend to perform 
less. So if you link the volume of aid directly to the, to, the, to the outcomes, you may think that there is a negative correlation. But it's because, that, because, you are, because there are other factors other than resources, other than aid, that, uh, that explain the lower performance in lower income countries. Many of them are fragile states, conflict, conflict countries, so that aid is actually not necessarily promoting development, but it's used for humanitarian emergencies. Um, in this case, it really uh, it's demonstrated my, 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 my concern, which was a quantity concern, is that if, unless these countries get more aid, they cannot go over the hump and get, get uh, growth, growth going. Uh, but this has Im important implications on how we evaluate aid, uh, aid effectiveness. It means that we have to be very, very uh, uh, cognizant of the heterogeneity across countries the conditions, the initial conditions in those countries, and be able to evaluate relative prog progress rather than absolute progress. So in the sense that, say, a post-conflict countries may have huge gains relative to where they start from, but if you compare it to a country in peace that have been growing, uh, growing, growing faster, you may, see, you, may, you may conclude that they have not performed well. But so we can't treat all countries the same. We have to be very, very, very specific. But the, 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 the key message is targeting can work. Initial conditions do work. The quantity and effectiveness of aid are very important. Thank you very much. OK, so we're joined by uh, Kai now from Heidelberg University, who's been working a great deal on uh, gender analysis and gender issues. Um, the papers from the, um, yeah, why don't you come up and then we're all here um, for the discussion. Uh, the papers, by the way, are on the uh, Recon website. Uh, you're very much invited to visit the website and to sign up. Kai. Ladies and gentlemen, first I want to thank Uno Wider as well. And I'm happy to be here and present the results of our research. Donors of official development assistance have committed themselves to target gender issues. They have, um, they have uh, or they want to uh, allocate aid to sectors where gender inequality is particularly serious or to countries where gender inequality is a particularly se serious concern. The little provocative question that we ask in our research is, is this just gesture politics or do donors really follow that commitment? The results I'm presenting is joint work with the senior researchers uh, Axel Dreher from Heidelberg University and Stefan Klaasen from the University of Göttingen. We look at eight commitments from all bilateral and multilateral uh, duck donors from for, uh, all, for the whole period where data is available, that is from 1982 to 2011, and we also use disaggregated data in eight sectors that are most relevant to gender issues. That is, it's a very large-scale econometric analysis where we try to provide a really comprehensive picture. But I'll try to spare you with the details about all the econometrics we use and focus on our main conclusions. What we did can mostly be summarized in two questions. First is, we look at, do donors really respond to need in terms of gender inequality? That is, we look at the current state of inequality in developing countries and look, do donors allocate their decisions in response to that need? The second, result, the second set of results focuses on the question, do we actually, uh, do donors follow a merit-based aid allocation? That is, if countries can improve in terms of gender issues, for example, if they improve uh, in the ratio of uh, girls that finish primary schooling, do donors actually reward such improvement with increases in aid or what happens? <coughs> As uh, Karen has pointed out, we really face a multi-dimensional, multi-faceted problem which is why we chose to focus on five indicators. That is an index of uh, female rights, of course the important issue of education, but also labor market participation, life expectancy, which is a proxy for the overall health status of, of uh, women, and of course political representation of female. 
I also have to point out that the choice of these indicators is partly driven by data issues. That is the developing or the development of more comprehensive uh, indicators is still um, being done currently and not available for a long uh, data period. But it's a very important um, point that we really continue in developing more comprehensive indicators. We also look at uh, two different set of indicators, which is very important. First, the relative outcome of uh, women compared to men. And on the other hand, as well, to absolute outcomes for women. That is, for example, we look at the primary completion ratio of uh, girls compared to boys, as well as to the overall completion ratio of girls. To show you why it's important to consider different indicators, we can, for example, see if we look at female rights, that problem seems to be most severe in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, that is the dark regions on the map. On the other hand, when we look at the political representation of uh, women, that is the share of female MPs in parliaments, we can see that the issue seems to be most severe in, in the Middle East and Northern Africa region. Our first set of results, corresponding to the responsiveness to need, is that I have to say donors seem to only partially respond to need, but there are some areas where we find a respondents. That is when we look at education, low female church enrollment rates are actually followed by higher aid allocation. So to some extent donors take account of that problem. We also found, and that's uh, one of the most robust findings, that uh, when we look at life expectancy, both as imbalances in life expectancy between uh, men and women, as well as overall low female life expectancy, the donors really respond to this issue. That is, the health really seems to be on the agenda, and that's also what we see in the data. On the other hand, when we look at uh, women's rights, there's a little more aid, but overall this effect is economically not very large. And there's also more aid targeted at uh, women's equality that is specifically to promote female rights in the recipient country. There's also, and that's another very robust finding, female uh, political participation in developing countries see, really seems to be on the agenda. So that's an issue uh, where we see a close relation between higher representation of female is really rewarded with higher aid allocation. That sounds very positive, but there are also other areas where we find, and that's also what Karen mentioned, that with regard to labor market participation of women, that's on average mostly neglected by all donors. Really, there's absolutely no relationship that we can detect for average uh, aid allocation. As well, we cannot find any uh, significant correlation to primary schooling, and that's also something that we might want to consider. The second issue, and that differs a little in how we analyze the data, uh, in this second set of results we really um, controlled for the status quo and wanted to see if recipient countries succeed in improving in one area, for example if they succeed in increasing the share of girls uh, going to school, is, this, is such a behavior rewarded by uh, donors? Sadly, we have to say that we find little evidence of such a merit-based aid allocation, in particular improvements in education and improvements in female life expectancy are followed by considerable reductions in aid. That is, if a, de if a developing country succeeds in reducing this gap, it actually gets less aid. The one exception that we find is that uh, if recipient countries uh, succeed in increasing the share of female MPs in parliament, they're actually rewarded with more aid. So that's the one area where we find that uh, aid is allocated on a merit base. Overall, there are very few, I would say, I was surprised that there are so few areas where gender-specific improvements are really rewarded with higher aid commitments. There's a bunch of other analysis we do. I will, only, I will only present the maybe most interesting details. First, it seems to be important 
to consider the importance of gender issues actually in the donor country. That's an issue that has of all completely been neglected in the literature. That is, we found that donors that themselves have a higher share of female MPs seem to be much more sensitive to gender issues. We also find that on average, left-wing governments seem to respond stronger to need in terms of imbalances in education and female rights. And maybe another interesting finding, I don't know if it's surprising, but I find it quite interesting, there's also a gender gap in uh, responsiveness to aid allocation. That is, we actually find very consistently that male ministers, on the one hand, allocate aid to countries where female rights are already quite high, but it's only female ministers that react to need in terms of a whole series of other indicators. Only female ministers react when uh, there's low female tertiary enrollment rates. Only female ministers react to uh, gaps in life expectancy. So that's a very interesting finding. We also saw that only female development ministers actually uh, show some kind of rewarding behavior. That is, female ministers actually tend to reward improvements in female rights. And female ministers also tend to reward increases in female MPs in parliament. We also saw, I don't have that on the, on the slides, we also disaggregated our analysis uh, for all individual donors. That is, for example, we looked at what does the UN do? What uh, do Scandinavian donors do or what does the US do? And there we also find that there's a considerable heterogeneity between donors. For example, with regard to labor market outcomes that are overall neglected, we saw that Scandinavian countries actually respond to that indicators, but other countries don't. For example, the UN seems to put an emphasis on um, health issues, but also doesn't react so strong in other areas. Yeah. So as uh, Karen has also pointed out, there it's really a multi-dimensional problem that we are facing. And it's also very hard to tackle with empirical evidence. We found that donors really respond to need, but only in very few areas particularly labor market outcome is uh, not, doesn't seem to be on top of the agenda. We found that donors do not reward recipients for improvements. And I want to conclude with two questions. Maybe we need to take a more comprehensive approach and really consider all areas that are important uh, to empower women. And what incentives do we set if we do not reward improvements? What kind of long-run incentives do we really set for the recipients of aid if we do not reward improvements in those important areas? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Kai. <laughs> very interesting uh, set of results there. If you could, uh, maybe we bring the chairs around, then we can see the, if I could invite uh, Mina uh, up to the podium. Um, interesting questions there about the choice of uh, gender of your development minister, which I think uh, we'll get some discussion going over uh, a coffee. Also actually showing some of the power of uh, quantitative uh, analysis. Okay, Mina, okay, um, what are you going to tell us? Thank you, Tony, and um, I would like to thank Wider and, and Karen for, for organizing this. Um, okay, so what am I going to tell you? So I'm going to try to keep it, of course, I have no choice, keep it within the time <laughs> allowed. Um, so um, in my study, I looked at the effects of um, official development aid on women's equality organizations and institutions. So that's a specific, although not as specific as I, I would like it to be, but it's a specific area in terms of, you know, for that variable. And why is it that, so, and, and, and I looked at the, actually the, the aid on, on women's organizations for equal, equality organizations, that effect on women's empowerment, political empowerment, and I use the variable of just the share of women in, um, in parliaments, national parliaments, as an indicator of uh, political empowerment of women. 
So first of all, why is it that this interest in a political empowerment of women? Uh, of course, it's just one dimension. As, as Karen said uh, this morning, there are many, many dimensions to gender equality, but that's one dimension that hasn't been looked at a lot. We looked at uh, uh, the effect of aid on uh, gender gaps in education, in health, the effect of aid on fertility rates and so on, but the political empowerment of women is, hasn't been examined a lot in the literature, especially the empirical literature. So why? this focus. First of all, because political empowerment of women is also one of those things that are included in um, MDG3, which is about promoting gender equality and empowering women. So it would be interesting to see what happens in that area. The second um, thing is that gender equality itself, which includes women political empowerment, um, when it is good, it really has an um, impact on the other uh, Millennium Development Goals, um, and, and that's uh, something that has been documented in the literature and, and, and using empirical studies. Um, but at the same time, we have seen recently from data published, and lots of people are talking about the slugginess of progress towards gender equality. While countries are progressing on different MDGs, this, this million de development goal, goal, while there is some progress, but the progress is sluggish. So maybe, hopefully, we can come up with some things that we could implement to, um, you know, as world community to, to push the agenda forward. And um, the third reason for me is that um, uh, women's political empowerment can have significant effects for countries that are in transition. With the Arab Spring, I'm looking at the MENA region, which uh, includes Arab countries plus Iran and Israel uh, and Turkey. Um, but we have seen the transitions in some governments, and that's very important for me. Now, there is no, because this is new, the Arab Spring is relatively new, so there is no uh, long history of looking at data and see what's happened. But we can look at other countries uh, within Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where countries that were in transition and that included many women in their national parliaments, we can see certain if impact on the policies that came about. Now, many of us would like to see, uh, for example, in Rwanda, a lot more progress, but at least at, at the level of um, getting some actions in Parliament, some of them has been, and I, I cite an example which is the gender-based, the bill against uh, gender-based violence which was introduced by women in Rwanda when they joined in the Parliament, and it was successfully lobbied for and it was adopted in 2006. So just to give you a little example, but there is, there is evidence documented about other countries where really when you have um, a, a critical mass of women in Parliament that push for women's rights and, and bills and so on, that these things are happening. So that's very important for me, hence the focus on political empowerment of women. Okay, now the MENA region, uh, the MENA region has uh, substantially reduced, like most countries in the world, gender inequality in education and health. We, this morning we heard uh, and we saw data on that. Um, but when we look at all the countries, we still find some of the countries that, have, that still have high inequality in employment. Um, Klaas and, and, uh, and Lamana did a paper in 2000, study in 2009, and also there is the, the, a paper from the United Nations, a report, where we, we see these things, that um, women are not um, joining the labor force, and when they are in the labor force, they are not really having the, the, the best jobs, if you want, or jobs that pay. Uh, higher and managerial positions and so on. There are also some countries that tend to have high discriminatory social and legal institutions, and these can be, the social ones could be, for example, the bias, uh, the son bias, you, you want a, a, a boy as opposed to a girl. Although this has diminished a lot uh, compared to, say, 25 years ago or so, but it still exists. Uh, and there are other restrictions, for example, restricted physical integrity, and then there are discriminatory family laws, although again, in some of the countries uh, in recent, in the last five, six years, there were changes. Uh, I know in Morocco, where I'm originally from, um, there was a change in the Mudawana, which is the, the laws that, that govern the family law, uh, where now the, the husband cannot just go to the judge and say, I'm divorcing the woman who is staying at home, right? Um, you have to actually take the woman with you and she has to agree and all these things. So, and 
more importantly, the husband cannot just go and marry a second one and then bring her home without the first one knowing about it. Okay, then he needs actually the formal approval of the... Now, the implementation of these things really can take different forms, and of course, there are those who cheat, who would bring another woman, cover her face, say she cannot show the face, she, this is my first wife, she decides that they can marry, but then again, the government, when they see that, they come up with rules where actually there are women to take the woman who is covered to, to a house and then there is a woman who opens and looks at the face and looks at the ID and see if it's the same person. But anyway, those are technicalities and but we still we had to work on those to make sure that the implementations of the laws um, is happening. Um, and also there is, um, Kai showed some data about the DAC uh, aid going to, to gender equality. Um, if you look at just uh, here the North African countries of Algeria, uh, uh, Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia, uh, in 2010 there was about $11.5 million dispersed to women's equality organizations. And that was up from $3.83 million in 2000. That, that's a huge jump already. Um, and this amount reached $71.33 million in 2011. That's a huge jump. But remember, 2011, that's when we heard about lots of movements in North Africa and people, you know, demanding rights and so on. Uh, so this is just the aid allocated. The gross disbursements were $13.9 million in 2011, but it's still a lot higher amount than what's happening in 2010 and 2000, uh, two, and 2000 especially. Okay, so there is now more money put in these things. And um, now this is, I'm gonna go quickly over this. This is just a, um, a table that shows the percentage of women in national parliaments and regional differences. Of course, it comes at no surprise that Nordic countries of Europe are the, on the top. And uh, as you can see, 42% of the lower house are women. But the Arab states, I don't have the, the total percentage in this table for the, uh, the MENA, but the Arab states in particular uh, rank very low in, in this table. Again, this is not something that's uh, surprising. Now, within the region, you have countries like Yemen where women really are nowhere to be found in parliament, it's 0.3%, uh, going up to a country like Tunisia where the ratio is very high. The data are for 2010. Um, so there is a huge disparity. So what were the my main findings of my study? So this is a panel data from 2002 to 2010. The aid data were from the OECD um, statistics on, on aid, and the rest was from mainly from the World Bank, uh, World Development Indicators. So what are the main findings? First, the results suggest that official development aid to equality organizations and institutions is effective. Uh, in the sense that uh, it is associated with higher aid is associated with higher levels of representation of women in, in parliament. Um, it comes down to this where um, if I hold everything else constant, if we give $200 increase on ODA per 1,000 people, the number of seats or the share of seats in, in parliament goes up by three points, which is not uh, insignificant. Second thing is that in my study, I find that uh, autocracy, autocratic regimes are associated with lower share of women in parliaments. Um, it's not obvious because there were some studies that done on other countries that find that maybe in autocratic regimes, the, the autocratic regime decides so many women will have to go to parliament and it happens. This is not happening in the MENA region. Uh, and then evidence, there is evidence of a robust negative effect from adolescent fertility rates on women's political empowerment. And that's simple. When young girls get pregnant, have a child to take care of, they don't have time to worry about anything else. It's as simple as that. Um, but but uh, you know, um, another, another uh, finding also in the study is that if we give aid to family planning and reproductive health, it does not have an effect on political empowerment. So of course, when you give aid to family planning and reproductive health, you're not looking for political empowerment, you're looking for health, but one would hope that it will be an indirect effect, but that effect is not there. Um, what are the implications for aid um, allocation? Uh, one thing is that we need a critical mass of women uh, in parliaments because this can create more push for gender equality. Um, the second is there are some studies that have shown that increased female representation in politics is associated with significant changes in policy in the sense that women actually can enact uh, laws and policies that are female friendly, right? That are, that push for gender equality. 
And so um, these changes can be more significant, the higher, of course, the proportion of women in national parliament. Now, there is this issue of critical mass. What is the percentage that would be really a good percentage as a critical mass in, in parliament? So we can talk about that. But, but the more aid you give, the more women in parliaments you have, and then those women will push for better policies that are you know, supporting women. And so it becomes really kind, and that will, make, will empower women more. It becomes a virtuous circle, virtuous circle there. So foreign aid could have this catalytic role in this process. And that's, that's an important um, uh, route to think about. And then given that there is documented evidence on the ineffectiveness of aid to family planning in these countries, um, then it might be worth looking at whether foreign aid to family planning would be more effective if it were given to, to these organizations. And then as an indirect effect, we'll get lower fertility, we'll get better reproductive health and so on. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, Okay, well, this is the, the conclusion. So women in the MENA region played an important role in the Arab Spring, but not in all countries. For example, the participation of women in Yemen wasn't the same as the participation of women in, 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 in Tunisia. Um, and so, um, again, we have to look at where were, were there those differences. And then the rise of Islamist parties that have secured um, of course, this, the paper was written before the military took over again in Egypt, and even down, I had doubts, as you can see, it was written in the paper. They secured the jury and possibly also de facto power, but it turned out that actually the Islamists in Egypt did not secure de facto power, um, or at least not for a long time. So in some countries, it seems, this seems to create concerns about the gender equality. Women are worried that some certain things might be imposed again, uh, again on them. I was very deeply concerned about Tunisia, but so far it doesn't look like really the Tunisian women are suffering from this, but let's hope they will not suffer from it. And that concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Mina. Very rich conversation. If you could join us at the front, if you could just switch around. And of course, um, We've got 15 minutes till we have a coffee break and you can chat to some of the speakers uh, during the um, coffee break and obviously over lunch. So we can have this sort of team um, here. Okay, so you've been very patient in, in listening to some of the presentations. If I could take um, some interventions from the floor, if I could ask people to be very concise in their questions. Uh, you don't have to have, ask everything. And um, I'll just start on the side of the... Um, of the room first, I think. Are there any questions on this side of the room first? Yes, please. Could you uh, just briefly say who you are? And, um... uh, my name is Liv Tonnesen. I'm a senior researcher at the Christian Mikkelsen Institute in Bergen in Norway. I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but it's for the last presentation. Um, and it's a comment about the, your, um, um, about the political system and its effect on women's uh, the number of women in parliament. I'm just, um, if you open up uh, from northern Africa to the whole of Africa, then uh, whether it's uh, autocratic or dem uh, democratic has no effect uh, on women's uh, or, or the number of women in parliaments. But what does have an effect is whether the country is um, uh, post-conflict. Uh, so you see that in most of the countries in Africa that have been going through some kind of uh, conflict, uh, has a higher percentage of women in, in parliaments. So, so a crucial question there about fragility and conflict. One for uh, Mina, perhaps also the rest of the panel in a minute. Uh, the lady here, could you tell us um, who, you, uh, who you are? And if you could be relatively brief, please. Thank you. Yes, good morning. My name is Lynn Lichwana Carlton. I'm from the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences. Thank you to all the speakers. It's been extremely refreshing, especially when you do see a correlation between uh, the political uh, representation in terms of parliamentarians and how that affects uh, gender equality. I'm just thinking about a specific case in point where you have uh, representation at the highest order, like a female president in the country of Malawi, and yet where you have a very strong patriarchy and very little support in terms of, uh, let's say, the, the Nordic countries, which are quite forefront in, in gender issues. How does that play or what sort of um, advice or support could they be for such representation, which is at the very highest order? 
very interesting question there, a real, uh, real tension implicit in that one. Any other questions on this side before I leap over to Roger Williamson? Sorry, Roger, say who you are, because some people don't know. Thank you very much, Roger Williamson, IDS. Um, Kai, a question to you. I realize you had to summarize it quite briefly, but isn't there a danger of personalizing it just in terms of the female development ministers? Isn't the point much more that countries with a strong commitment uh, with social movements and in the bureaucracies to, uh, to gender equality are more likely to have a, uh, a woman development minister and that that will also be likely to have impact on the policy. I'm a bit worried about personalizing it in terms of just the minister. Thank you. Okay, so it isn't just the ministers. If we could have the microphone to feel me. If you could uh, identify yourself, please. Hi, I'm Paivi Karnisto from a Finnish Ministry for Foreign Affairs. And uh, Leons was mentioning in his presentation that the aid doesn't produce uh, macro results. Uh, because it doesn't impact policies and institutions. Is there a certain kind of aid that works better than some other kind of aid? Thank you. So with those scarce um, aid dollars, Leonce, where, where are you going to put those scarce aid dollars? We'll have to pin you down maybe onto one sector where you, you might prioritise. Any further questions or comments from either sides of the, uh, the room now? Okay, Finn? Finn Tarp, I think uh, you know Finn, so he doesn't have to introduce himself again. Th thank you very much. Uh, Kai, I was just wondering, when, when you were talking about merit-based aid and thinking about the specific indicators that you were listing, aren't we here in this area, which we sometimes as economists refer to as the endogeneity of aid, that as countries develop, as they need as, uh, uh, aid less, then obviously they should get less aid. Uh, I mean, this doesn't, I mean, I'm not saying this goes across all of the different variables, but I'm just sort of wondering about those specific areas, whether they're not really inherent into that process, and if they are, should we then be so unhappy about that? Okay, and that's, of course, a really interesting question in the context of the um, transition from uh, low income to middle income status and, uh, you know, the use of IDA resources and the attention of, of donors there. Okay, so if there are no other questions or comments, at the moment, I shall hand it back to the speakers. They will start with Mina at the very, uh, very end there. Mina. Yeah, thank you. Um, the first question was about uh, the, the fact that countries that just came out of uh, civil war or, or, or internal conflict have more female representation in parliaments. And um, uh, first of all, I didn't look at those countries, of course. I'm, I'm, I looked specifically, except if you think of Lebanon as one of those countries, but then Lebanon has been more or less stable for some time, uh, until at, at least until the end of the, the year in my data. Um, but in, uh, my understanding is that um, when you are coming out of uh, a conflict, you are actually in the process of reconstruction, and you are, and I wish you would think of women as part of constructing a society, and as just reconstructing. But anyway, uh, part of it could be aid donors insist that women are represented uh, in, in the process, so that's why they end up with more women. Uh, uh, but uh, I don't see... Um, I mean, I didn't look at them in terms of empirical studies because, again, I looked at 13 MENA countries and they did not include ones that suffered, with the exception of Iraq, but I didn't have enough data for Iraq anyways in, 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 in the paper, so I do talk about that. Now, the, so, but it is a very relevant point, so maybe um, as a, an extension of this work I could add those countries or look specifically at countries that are uh, that uh, are had recent conflict and see what happened there then compare to countries that didn't have a conflict and see the difference um, but uh, the point was also about the autocratic or democratic regimes again we are looking only at the mina countries and heavily uh, you know the arab countries are heavily represented in that pool and the uh, arab countries as we know most of them have actually autocratic regimes, starting with uh, Morocco, even though they have a parliament and everything, but it is an autocratic regime. Um, the second question was about the fact that there is representation at the, uh, high levels in some countries, 
with women in Africa, but it's not just Africa. Sometimes people think that this um, gender inequality in the Arab countries or the MENA is because of religion. But it's not, because there are two countries at least that come to mind that had women at the highest level, Bangladesh and Pakistan, and those are Muslim countries. So it's, it's more than, it's, it's not just religion, it's not, it's not religion specifically, but it's the way people behave in society towards women. So uh, what can they learn from that? Of course, in Morocco you cannot be president because they have a king, so I, they cannot even have a queen. The, the wife of the king is called princess, she cannot be called queen, so. Um, but, but in countries like Tunisia, why not? I mean, really, I, am, I, I hope that before uh, the end of my life, I see a woman uh, in Egypt or in Tunisia as president. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, these things are not... Uh, now, you talked about the fact that these are patriarchal societies. Of course, they are patriarchal societies. But then many societies around the world, if you look 100 or 200 years ago, they were like that too. So we're waiting for progress. And it's just, in my sense, it's not happening fast enough in, in, in the MENA region. Thank you. Thanks, so... Progress is not, uh, not fast enough, and, uh, but it is um, an extraordinarily interesting region. Colleagues should note also that there's a recon um, program of work on governance and fragility, which we've been doing with DEES, and I do um, encourage you to go look at that, because this isn't, isn't just what we say on uh, fragility. So, Kai. Thank you very much for the question. I think they are both really interesting. I try to summarize uh, the first question. I think it was mainly about uh, should we really focus on the gender of the minister or is it in addition like the bureaucracy and the commitment of the bureaucracy that of course drives uh, aid allocation. And I completely agree. It was not my intention to focus on the gender. On the other hand, I think uh, one could say that um, while uh, the likelihood that a minister is female or male is probably not completely random, but due to the sad um, importance that the post of a development minister still has in many countries, it's kind of random if uh, he, he or she happens to be female or male. I can just um, uh, tell from Germany, where right now our supposedly new development minister is someone who before was responsible for mostly uh, traffic and infrastructure. So he didn't chose to become minister or he, he was, it's kind of a result of a political bargaining process. So I think there might be something, something to that result that also it sounds convincing to me that female ministers might just care a little more. I think the second question was concerned with the merit-based approach and of course, a uh, lot of endogeneity issues when we do econometric analysis of aid. And uh, yeah, I cannot agree more that that is a problem. I first, of course, we control for a lot of factors, but as a more general I comment, while of course it makes sense that we allocate aid to countries where need is most severe or where the situation is particularly bad, I think as economists we have to or I as an economist always was told to keep in mind that incentives matter, in particular for the long run. And there are, very, there are some examples uh, that merit-based aid allocation really can make a difference. I think there's a paper by Ulla et al. who look at US aid and their Millennium Challenge Account project where they set particularly goals for recipient countries and uh, promise them to reward aid or maybe eight in another category if they uh, achieve these goals. And that was quite successful. So I think there, yeah, we should consider incentives, particularly in the long run. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kai. By the way, um, just before we moved on to Leon, so I was quite worried about Kai's results. Um, I'm sure it's a very good, you know, the econometrics is sound, but um, donors aren't rewarding increased primary schooling and better labor market outcomes. Because, you know, Amartya Sen, you know, said to us explicitly, <laughs> <laughs> this is where the action is. So, um, hmm, something's going um, not quite right there. We do actually have a big program of recon work on the social sectors, and I really encourage you to take a look at that. There's a lot of papers, a lot of interesting work there. So, again, complementing here the gender. Leonce, now, maybe you're the chap who's going to answer the question on Malawi, but... Uh, about no, leadership and patriarchy. Okay, well, maybe it's going to be over coffee, but Leonce. I leave the question to of Malawi to Lina. Um, I have a discussion with uh, my colleague over, over 
coffee. Um, because I think, I think it would be a good thing that do, aid, donors reduce aid when education improves so that they can move aid to the countries that have lower education. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about that. Um, and it, it, the reason I start with that it has to do with my answer to the, to the question about institutions. Um, I think the, one of the problem, the, the first problem is, is that uh, donors are conflicted in the sense of do we leave institutions to the domain of the sovereign states that we don't want to interfere with domestic, uh, domestic uh, uh, processes or do we take cognizance of the fact, it's an empirical fact, that institutions are very, very important for development. The better the institutions, the better the policies, and the better the efficiency of the use of resources. So if you, if you, if you are aware of that fact, then it's counterproductive to not actually act upon it. And unfortunately, when donors kind of act upon the fact that institutions are good for growth, they take institutions as a condition for giving aid which is counterproductive. So we will wait until you have good institutions until we, and then we'll give you aid. When is that? Low, less developed countries tend to have lower, better, worse institutions. So if you, have, if you want to help them, you actually have to work on the institutions. You have to help them improve the institutions. I give you a, a couple of examples of where, when donors actually do that, you have good results. One is in the tax, uh, administration uh, area, where donors have worked with countries to reform the tax system. An example is Uganda. In 1991, the UK put a lot of money and people uh, in technicians in the tax system and established the tax author the, the autonomous the Ugandan autonomous authority. And you go find look at the evidence. It's clear: tax collection improved. The same in, 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, Ghana, uh, in Kenya, in Burundi, it's more, in a more recent exp experience, but there is positive results. I um, uh, was talking to a colleague from the OECD who is working on the, on the, tax, uh, the tax program, and they are developing targeted inter interventions that actually go to countries with technical experts to help them in the tax audit and tax implementation. And you do see positive results. So my sense is that if we want to see gains from aid, that's the area we want to go to. I give a, the, the last example is in transport. When you look at the transport cost, that's the paper I'm writing now, they, they are much higher for landlocked countries and in Africa relative to other, to other, to other countries. So how do donors react? They go put more money in building more roads. No, that's not how you do that. Look at the management in the, in the industrial organization of the sector to improve effectiveness of the use of the infrastructure. Because you may have roads which are not being used. You may have roads which are, which are, which are not uh, produce, produce, which are not productive because there's huge governance, governance problems. So in addition to giving countries good roads, you actually need also to teach them how to manage the, the tracking industry, the, the, the transit corridors and so on. And there's so, a gender dimension there, of course, yes, which is of course enormous. There are huge gender enormous dimensions. Enormous burdens um, yes, if, carried if by women. Yes, if you have bad roads, bad connected to, uh, poorly connected to markets, then the women are going to pay the price of they, they do the farming, but they, don't, they can't sell their crops, so they, have, they don't generate the, the, the rewards for, for their hard work. So I think we can't go around institutions. Of course, it's very difficult. The problem is that the impact is going to, many times, it's medium term, long term. And unfortunately, here I want to be frank, as donors, we want immediate results. So that if I go into a country, I want to come back three months later and have a report on how many schools have bought, how many uh, built. But if you talk about developing institutions, you may have to invest more time in that. 